Um, hi, Simon. Thanks for helping my project. Uh, could you say oh. a little bit about yourself? Uh, hello, I am Simon Geria. I am a writer and producer based in the UK. Um, I have written various bits and pieces about the moon and space. Uh, I have brought a couple of props. So I wrote a chapter in this book, which accompanied the uh, exhibition a couple of years ago at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Uh, and I wrote a, a, a piece on how the uh, Apollo 11 moon landing was broadcast on television in the UK and how it affected film and television as well. Uh, and I also write things like this. Uh, this is a trilogy of Doctor Who audio stories and they feature the Doctor going to the moon and meeting early lunar colonists. Um, could you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your stories? Uh, like um, um, what in the Doctor Who one, what is the moon colony like? It's very early days. And the thing that um, inspired it was a conversation I had when I was doing the book with, for uh, the Royal Observatory. One of the things that we talked about was the legal side of space travel and going to the moon and what jurisdictions and what legislation would apply. Um, and I kind of had this idea that you kind of, because of the idea that you are um, constrained by your the laws of your own nation when you go into space, that if you're gonna permanently settle on the moon, you kind of have to make a break. You kind of have to set surrender your Earth citizenship to move to the moon. So uh, we have colonists who are uh, in the process of making what they call the leap. And so the giant leap is to surrender being an Earth person and, and kind of creating yourself a, a new identity. Um, so that's what they're in the process of doing. And then there are some monsters called Sontarans that are waiting in the wings to cause mayhem and havoc. Uh, and the Doctor has to sort it out. I, I will have to take a listen to that. Uh, so what got you into writing? Um, I, I always, I always did write, you know, like, like as kids, you sort of write stories and draw pictures and stuff. I just haven't stopped. Um, as a kid, I, you know, if, if an adult had said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Writer was definitely in there, but so was pop star and astronaut. You know, I didn't really um, I didn't really click that it was something you could do as a job until I was in my late teens. Um, and then kind of I kind of gravitated towards anything that would get me into writing. So I worked in publishing and I worked in um, media companies and things all trying to get closer to what I actually wanted to do, which was just to write, which I've been doing since uh, uh, I've been freelance since 2002. Hmm. Uh... And I guess uh, in terms of your interest in the moon, uh, where does that originate from? Uh, well, I was into sci-fi as a kid. So I was into Star Wars and Doctor Who in a big way as a kid. Um, I had various, you know, my, my brother and I divided up our, you know, I had the space Lego and he had the castle Lego. And that was kind of how we, we kind of divided things up. And uh, there was a uh, uh, toys made by a company called Britons, which were um, various space ships and space people and stuff. So I was I was always interested. Um, I think when I about two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, I started. So my wife worked at the um, observatory in Greenwich a long time ago, uh, sort of twenty years ago. And through that, I met some of the people there who did the science exhibit, exhibits and things. And I ended up doing a GCSE course as a night class in astronomy um, mm. to kind of give me a bit more of a grounding in the, the science of stuff for the stuff I was writing. And that's kind of led to me writing bits of science books and um, putting more science into the stories and stuff. And I do find space travel really interesting. Uh, and boggling and difficult. Um, so it's something I keep returning to. Um, 
That that's interesting, and I, I'm kind of curious. You know, in terms of this latest push to go back to the moon, like uh, I, I was wondering when it when you became aware of it. Uh, so, do you mean Artemis? And yes, yeah. So, I must have heard about Artemis. I mean, it, there's been talk for a long time, hasn't there, of, about going back to the moon. So, I've kind of I've kind of kept a weather eye on that. Um, I think when they actually started firing rockets again it was like oh no that this might actually happen and then in the last few months it's got very exciting because it's you know there's a sort of palpable disappointment when the launches didn't happen because it's a real thing it's not just you know oh yeah we'll be because it was always like oh yeah we'll go back in the next decade we'll go back in the next next decade now it looks like it might actually happen and there was a news story last night uh here in the UK about some of the people who um, have applied to be astronauts. Um, and that's really interesting. That's like, that's like, you know, that's not a special program about a space program. That's just a bit on the news where they're actually talking to people who might be in space in the next few years. So I find that, you know, very uh, exciting um, and strange and, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of I'm kind of keeping my eye on it, really. Um, you know, I, I started this project with uh, the plan of just going up to people at coffee shops and uh, at the the mall, and you know, uh, just just wherever I would find people. And I did I I did that at the beginning, and I, I still do that from time to time. Uh, would it surprise you that you know of the random people that I talked to, about eighty percent have no clue we're going back to the moon? I think, yeah, I mean, this is this is something that, that has come up when I was doing my stuff about um, the history of the Apollo program and how it was broadcast. The thing that really struck me about that was it was a similar thing then that um, in the UK, there was a guy called uh, James Burke who presented a science. He was one of the presenters on a science show. And they basically the BBC basically said to him, right, you, you're going to go off and do the coverage of this thing. And he was like, well, I don't know anything about it. So he sort of read what he could, went out to Florida and interviewed people and did bits of pieces of camera and stuff, reporting from himself, which he said all sounded very, it was all very technical. The US um, press were kind of asking astronauts, you know, the would-be astronauts about what their wives thought of it and what their children mm. thought of it and, you know, this kind of stuff. He asked more technical questions because he'd done the reading and got slightly more, you know, um, complex and rich answers and stuff. So made fairly good um, television. And then he said, I think he said it was Apollo 8. And having kind of tried to make his news reports interesting, suddenly Apollo 8 caught people's imagination. And it was the fact that they'd take it, they'd, you know, they'd broadcast at Christmas and they'd taken pictures and all of this kind of stuff suddenly what had seemed like a quite abstract idea and although people had talked about it and it had been in the news and things had riffed on it that was what really captured people's imagination and then suddenly from apollo 8 to actually landing on the moon was a you know fairly short period of time so it was very busy and exciting for that period because it was real and it was you know and there was stakes and are they going to make it and so on and so on. But the corollary of that is that that was such a explosion of interest that it died off very quickly as soon as they'd done that, you know, and, and, and because they'd not put in things like, what are we actually going for? Um, there's very little talk in the press, in the coverage of the time about um, what the scientific purposes are, what we might learn, what we can do, what the long-term aims are. Um, so it didn't really connect with people. And you can see that. So the BBC and ITV, the two channels, the two networks that we had in the UK, they had this issue, which was that they were going to get footage at some point from the, you know, relayed from the moon. But they didn't know when. They weren't sure whether it would work as a mission. They weren't sure if the transmission of TV images would work. It was all set up to be broadcast at prime time in the US. So it was going to be very late. You know, the, the walking on the moon was about three in the morning in uh, the UK. 
So what both the BBC and ITV did is what they always do when they've got a live event. They basically put on what in the States is called variety and we know as light entertainment. And they had celebrity guests and they just filled time. And they, uh, Pink Floyd did a, a live jam session on BBC One. Um, they played, the BBC played David Bowie's uh, uh, Space Odyssey for the first time. That was the first time it was broadcast. They um, they had comedy sketches. They had Ian McKellen and Judy Dench, who were then very young and, you know, the future of the acting profession. They were reading Moon-inspired poetry. Um, they had, you know, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was on ITV um, chatting about what the moon meant. Um, and, you know, and Ray Bradbury, who was a, a big science fiction writer, was a guest, was supposed to be a guest on, on ITV. And he kind of stood in the wings of the studio going, what is this? What is it? And, and, and walked out, basically didn't want to be any any part of this weird chaos. And because they then, um, because the, the, the US uh, uh, then decided it's all gone well, we're going to bring the moon walk forward so that it's in prime time and everyone can watch it. The, the UK channels are then like, what do we do? Do we carry on playing through the night? So they got, they'd never done that before. They'd never broadcast into the into the early hours. You know, in, the, in those days, television would, would close down at sort of half 11 at night or midnight or so. So these live variety shows with guests who were, you know, probably being given complimentary drinks and snacks and stuff, just carried on, but with nothing scheduled. So they just had to fill time. So the, the weirdest kind of programme of not really knowing why we're doing this and, you know, it would have been, it would have been chaos. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so ITV's programme was called David Frost's Moon Party. Um, and, and they just, you know, filled time, waiting all the time in their earpieces or, or I think they had earpieces by that point, but waiting all the time for somebody to go, oh, we've got a, transmission or we've got a bit of footage to show or we've got a whatever so so chaos and and what's what i find fascinating about that is this is you know as i'm sure you're aware a really monumental bit of history and neither the bbc or the itv or itv thought it was worth keeping their coverage of the moon landing they wiped it you've got to be kidding so so they they kept what they kept was the transmissions that they received. So they kept footage of Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon and the telemetry and that sort of stuff, which obviously NASA has got in its original form in much higher resolution and much better nick. Mm. But all of the variety stuff, all of the whatever, there's some bootleg recordings. There's a bootleg recording of the uh, of the Pink Floyd jam session. There, There's odd clips of presenters um, you know, you just see them very, very briefly, uh, uh, like, you know, 30 seconds worth of bits and pieces. But yeah, they, they th that I, I find, I think that's really indicative of how people felt about space travel, that it was, that it wasn't, you know, that, that the cultural import of it was completely overlooked. And I think that's kind of where we are now, similarly. That it's kind of going on and you know people are aware but they're not really engaging with it and mm. part of the issue with space travel is that it's very expensive so if people aren't engaged with it it's very difficult to justify and you can see in you know for example somebody like elon musk and the stuff he was doing was quite engaging and it caught people's imagination and you know sending a car into space and whatever but that is that a sustainable way of doing space travel? He seems, I don't really know, but, but he seems to have lost interest in going to Mars now. It, it's not really talked about so much. Um, and also, where did that enthusiasm for what he was doing go? It kind of fizzled out again. And similarly, so you, you build all this enthusiasm, but you need a kind of more sustained long-term way of engaging people. And I think the efforts to concentrate on the science and the technical end of stuff may be the way that that works. Because 
that's not going to go away. And we're, you know, so the, the prospect of finding water on the moon, the prospect of whatever, that's a long term story. That's not just a one chunk. Here's something exciting that we found. Um, so, yeah, so so we'll see. We'll see. But it's it's um, it's weird. You know, my my. My entire life, nobody's been on the moon because um, I was born after that all finished uh, and I'm in my late 40s. So it's a, it's a. You know, it's a weird one. I, I kind of I kind of want to live in a space age again. That's that's kind of what I was promised as a kid. And um, and I I want to I want to have that basically. Yeah, I, I just missed Apollo myself also. And uh, the previous NASA administrator also had just missed Apollo. So maybe that's why he was so keen on seeing uh, Artemis happen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. My mum was uh, was pregnant at the time with my older brother. So she went to bed early. You know, she watched the beginning of the of the live telly and just kind of left my dad to go and watch it with the neighbours and stuff. And... Um, yeah, and it's it you know for those who who were there, it's a big, um, it's a big moment and stuff. But but I just feel we're all missing out. Um, now you you said something that kind of caught my ear. I, I like to probe on it just a little bit more. Uh, you said uh, Elon's lost interest in colonizing Mars. I, I was just wondering, um, kind of, uh, um, how you came to that conclusion. Well, it's, it's not so much it's not so much that he what, what I mean is it, it doesn't seem to, uh, the, that you used to hear a lot about that. And that yes. used to be what he was known for. Now he's got other things going on. Other things. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and without getting into all of that. But 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 Mars doesn't seem to be. You know, that's not the thing that people are talking about. They're, 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 and because, and, it, and even within the space kind of news cycle where stuff gets mentioned what they're talking about artemis and the moon that you know you, you get people talking about sending robots to mars and, and updates on that but you don't really hear as much about um sending people to mars and and what what are you kind of in is that thing of going well three years ago they were going yeah we'll be on mars by the end but in about 10 years and now they're saying we'll be on mars in about 10 years and it's that kind of mission creep thing um mm-hmm. so that, you know I don't, I don't mean to i don't mean to, to cast a, any kind of judgment on it or, or whatever i just i just think that that there was a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and engagement in the story of going to mars and somewhere that's been um what's the word um somewhere that that kind of public interest has been lost in, uh, in the last few years it is it's kind of interesting. I, you know, we just had Artemis One launch last week. Uh, have yeah. you been following that? Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I watched it. I watched the launch. Yeah, and um, and uh, I know a couple of people who are involved in some of the kind of commentary and news bits and stuff. So uh, uh, I kind of hear from them and and follow them on Twitter and things. So yeah. Um, and as I say, it was on the, it, you know, they had a, a thing about one of the potential astronauts on the news last night. So, so yeah, it feels like it's slowly clawing its way into the wider culture. Um, a lot of people ask me, why are we going to the moon? And how would you answer them? Yeah, so, so I think there's two questions there, isn't there? There's one of why are we going? And two, can we justify how much it costs? Because that, you know, it does cost a lot. Um, And there are other things that we could be spending the money on. And I think that there's a number of things. I mean, there's the science, there's resources on the moon. We think if there's water and stuff, we might be able to build things. And there's ideas about, you know, what we could do to, the the film moon by duncan jones has ideas about how you use the moon as a fuel source and stuff um i think also there's that idea that we should just get out there and not just be restricted to one rock in space and and that there are you know as a as a writer and historian who spends a lot of time in archives i'm you know I'm quite taken by the idea that you could use the moon 
to keep records on and archive material in case of a disaster on earth so that would you know something of us would survive uh, i find that quite um interesting and and i think there's enough that you know there are things about going there there's things about what we can learn there's things about how it might affect how things like weightlessness and stuff might affect um health because you know can it can being in space help people with various physical conditions and ailments and stuff um so there's there's lots of sort of potential things that we can learn and do and change about ourselves i think also going to the moon changes our perspective of ourselves um one of the big things about the um the earthrise picture taken by the crew of apollo 8 is it you know you can see the impact that had on things like the environmental movement very quickly because a it showed the earth in color um so it's a ve very vivid precious jewel that kind of idea of earth as a as a jewel is a thing that needs to be protected it shows us all together so it kind of unites you know kind of it kind of there's no national boundaries visible on that picture uh so we're all kind of in it together um and also i think if you look at another of the things that came out of my my looking at how tv and stuff represented things if you look at representations of the earth from before we actually took a picture of it so if you think about the old universal logo at the beginning of films or any time in a sci-fi show they show planets and other what they show is of the blue sea and the green brown land and that's it what's really striking about photos from space after that is the earth is a much more complex system because it's got cloud and it's got the swirls of uh, a white across it and activity so it's so there's that sense of um of an ecosystem as being a busy and engaged thing and a changing thing and i think that that has had a profound effect on how we think about ourselves and our environment and our and what we're doing to our environment all of those things um come from like a sing uh, what is effectively a single picture but you know there's been other pictures there's been other footage but that all comes from actually a very small amount of data that captured people's imagination and i think the more we're in in on the moon and in space and stuff the more that kind of stuff will come through and the the profound ideas that we might find life the profound ideas that we might not find life the profound sense that you know i think it's amazing that in we might not have missed the uh we might have missed the moon landings but in your and my lifetime we've developed a permanent presence in space and there's just been people up there, which I remember that being mooted in the 80s. I think somebody said it when I was at school, you know, like a, some scientist on the telly sort of talked about that and thinking that was the most outrageous sci-fi idea. And now it's just something that happens in the background that we don't really pay any attention to. Um, so I, th I think all of those things are really valuable. The, the issue is... Um, how do you justify what is spent on getting there and i think that is there are a number of issues there what kind of economic benefit is there from going what resources might we find you know the the possibility of finding water there suddenly makes that case much easier to make um and I, I remember a, a debate I went to where where there were quite a lot of people, you know, you, you must have seen the protests at the time of the Apollo 11 moon launches in America about, you know, uh, uh, ethnic minority groups and, mm -hmm. and church groups and stuff were kind of saying there are a whole lot of better things we could spend this money on to, to sort out equality and stuff. And I, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And yet, as somebody said at this debate, it's not as if that money was going to be spent on those causes. It's not it's not a, you know, it's not a, a zero sum game. It's not like where well, you can go to the moon or you can solve social problems. Yes, we should be solving social problems, but it's not like we're taking money away from social problems to go to the moon. So so, um, you know, I think. And and yes, I, I think the morality of it is is tricky, but I don't think it's as simple as just going, you know, we should all spend it on 
I don't know, whatever, um, uh, uh, charity and stuff. Um, so I, I think, but I think, I think that kind of stuff is why it's taken so long to get back. Um, and, and again, if you're not thinking about things like the return on investment and the long term strategy and, and 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 how you keep people engaged and thinking it's worthwhile doing it's going to be a flash in the pan return what what is kind of needed is a sustainable long term uh uh proof of proof of value really um and i hope that's what it's got because it would be sad if we you know send artemis and then don't do anything for another 50 years it's it's funny you talk about engagement and I guess uh, another word would be like involvement and people is a, a way to uh, actually be part of it. And, yeah. you know, as part of this, I, I ask people, you know, what do you think about going back to the moon? It's like, why are we doing it? You know, and we've been there before and all this stuff. And, you know, you ask a follow up question, would you go uh, to space? You're like, yeah, you know, and, you know, and that, nobody wants to send the other guy to space. They want to go. You know, and if you can make that happen, they're they're all for it. But if not, then you know why why bother? <laughs> yeah, I I think I I don't I'm quite tall, and I don't fit on planes and buses, and I am quite aware that going into space is uncomfortable. Um, I am quite happy for somebody else to do it until <laughs> until they sort out the comfort end of it. Um, I, I'm quite happy. I quite like the. Um, that little pod that William Shatner went up in, into space. That looked quite comfy. That looked like, that looked quite first class uh, uh, treatment. I could do that, I think. But um, yeah, and and you know, all the I've spoken to, um, I've spoken to people about what space being in space does to your body, and how you know that it draining your sinuses because your uh, because your sinuses fill up because they don't drain away because of gravity you lose your sense of taste and you know all of that kind of stuff and you feel constipated and you know all of that sort of stuff it doesn't sound exactly like fun um you know i i think i think i need more persuading but then that's why i want to send people to so they can go and sort that out and then you know hopefully in my dotage it'll be somewhere that i can go and it'll be nice and comfy and uh you know you know, most people I talked to said they would go to space, but of the ones that don't, do you know what reason most of them give? Uh, no. Claustrophobia. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it is weird. I've, I've spoken to some people like, like, um, there's a few interviews about, you know, what it does to you and, and the sort of cabin fever thing. The thing is, I, I work from home. I'm a freelancer and I did lockdown before everybody else did. You know, and I I take my kids to the school, which was at the end of I'd take the kids to school, which was at the end of our road. And I'd go to the shop, which was at the other end of our road. And that was it. That was my life. You know, and the rest of the time I'd just be sat at home typing. So when people were talking about cabin fever with lockdown, I was like, yeah, I, I went mad like three years ago and uh, had to be found excuses to go off and do errands and stuff. Uh, and and find ways to talk to people during the day um and uh yeah but i think it, we've all done lockdown and we all got kind of got through it i mean some people went nuts but but yeah i think i think you get you you can kind of do it people could do long haul flights you know the 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 that kind of stuff is all it, which which you know it's not too long ago that the idea of being on a plane for 24 hours was a completely unthinkable way of traveling and now people do it fairly regularly um so yeah i think i think all of those things are manageable it's funny you say you you went mad before everybody else working from home and that type of thing uh, that's actually part of the origin of this project because i had worked from home for two years and I thought this would be a good, ex, you know, reason, excuse, prompting, prodding, whatever you want to call it, to actually get me out of the house each day to actually go yeah, talk. Yeah. To yeah, yeah. And then COVID happened. So, what do you say? <laughs> but, that, but that, but I mean, what you're doing is you're connecting with people about what this all means, and I think that's the, 
that's it that i think the, the problem is the space is so big and so out there and you have to be so qualified to get there and you know all and so few people go you know 12 people in 50 years in more than 50 years walked on the moon all from a certain demographic all from the same country you know all of this kind of stuff it doesn't feel like it's part of my life you know in, in, in a in the day-to-day -day world how do you make it about that well you know the, the things like non-stick saucepans coming you know the technology for teflon coming out of space development technology there that that's a right there is a thing that this is how it has affected your life the idea of sat nav and satellite anything um coming out of the kind of communications technology that was developed through this sort of stuff all of those kind of things understand getting people to understand how their lives have been shaped by this sort of stuff um and to engage with it is i think is i think really important um and if you do and, and that's that's kind of what's lacking i think at the moment um not isn't artemis and sending people to the moon exciting but but so what why 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 what's that going to change for me at home how's that going to when I'm queuing up to buy eggs in the shop, how does that affect me and whatever? And it's kind of like, well, there are things that are going on and things that it will change in effect. So, um, well, since you looked into uh, the moon and Artemis and things like that, I wanted to run this by you. Recently, I've listened to a book called Idea Factory, which is about um, Bell Labs um, and kind of uh, how it was a source of innovation and sort of like the setup with the AT&T monopoly and, and that type of thing. And what's amazing to me from that book is how much of our modern like computing and communications infrastructure really came out of that lab and was really prompted more from the problems that uh, AT&T had in terms of maintaining and managing its network. And the only reference to space that I saw in that book was about, um, that, that communication satellite Echo, I think it was called, and a few communication satellites. And I just wonder sometimes if maybe uh, um, the spinoffs that we accredit to Apollo um, may not be precisely correct. And I was wondering what your thought might be. I think, yes, that is interesting. There's a number of things. So, so I live near, um, you know, sort of 15 minutes drive from the radio telescope at Jodrell Bank, which was uh, one of the things that tracked the Apollo rockets and, and flights and sort of verified that they were real. And Jodrell Bank is a radio telescope really designed for looking at galaxies and stuff further. You know, it was originally used to look at meteors, but that sort of galaxies and that kind of stuff is what it is kind of bread and butter stuff is but that came out of radar technology and bernard lovell who who was the scientist who who began the jodrell bank project um had worked in radar during the second world war so it's really uh an offshoot of military defensive technology and when you have something like the war there are there's a kind of intensification of development and trying to find new stuff. And radar, the use of radar, medical techniques, engineering techniques, manufacturing techniques, there's, there's kind of like an explosion of, of new ways of doing things and, and new economies of doing things and whatever. Where, so that there's a whole change in the way that things are done as a result of the war. And I think that's what happens with... I don't know Bell as well as you do, obviously, because I haven't read that book, but that that kind of is what happened with Bell in terms of them basically opening up opportunities for research and development and incentivizing better ways of working. You know, an awful lot of places, an awful lot of institutions do things the way they've always done things and are very resistant to change or to trying things. Um, and that and in a war or in an organization that's looking for this kind of stuff, or you know, even with COVID, you look at developments in vaccines and that kind of stuff that's transformed healthcare in one form or another. 
um, the way that hospitals and, and medical people are much more tuned up to the possibilities of doing things online and that you can have communicate, you know, you can talk to doctors online and stuff. And what you find is that the incidence of doctors going off sick has gone down because they're seeing fewer patients who might have colds or flu or whatever. Um, and that kind of, that kind of, um, but also the idea that you can do therapeutic stuff by keeping people in touch using iPads and stuff um, when there are issues about hospital visits or let alone all the fancy stuff about what else they might be able to cure with vaccines and what vaccine rollout, and how things have benefited vaccine rollout. All of those kind of things come from this very intense period of people trying to solve big problems basically and, and improve things so yes i think you know does uh the first i think one of the first satellite broadcasts um as a, as a tv thing was the beatles doing all you need is love and does that is that a the result of the space program you know is it is it directly is it not i but i think i think the the fact that things were being developed and people were and engineers in television were trying to link up to satellites and trying to engage with it is part of the space program but also the kind of cultural footprint of something like all you need is love is a way that that kind of advancement and technology has impacted people's lives in a way that they get um similarly uh one of the things i put in my my thing for the moon book is that stanley kubrick obviously did 2001 and um there's you know various people who worked at nasa kind of said he got to the moon before they did and you know because it was felt very realistic it felt like he'd done his research and got things right but one of the um things that the the, the team going to the moon needed was high resolution photographs of the lunar surface so that they could find landing sites and that's what apollo 8 was doing it was it was trying to map the surface of the moon which was you know these gray rocks and then they looked up and it was like quick change to a color film because there's a beautiful jewel of the earth in space and stuff um and that was a that was a sort of accidental byproduct of of being there but in developing better camera technology to um uh uh map the moon and, and map this kind of stuff they developed lenses that with very little light you could get a pretty good picture and um stanley kubrick used those on barry Lyndon, his next you know two, two films after 2001 and was able to do a film set in the 18th century where rather than using big electric lights he lit his shots with candlelight so you get this effect on that film that it looks like a 18th century painting. It's extraordinary, you know, and I, I recommend seeing it in the cinema because it's an extraordinary visual experience. So madly, that authentic 18th century look to that movie comes from NASA developed space technology used by the guy who did 2001. And I find that kind of stuff really fascinating that that kind of odd adjunct of how space travel and stuff affects culture and and things that you wouldn't really expect and i think I, you know i think yeah i think the non-stick frying pan makes my life easier uh uh now um you know all the kind of pet that you used to be able to get pens that could write upside down and you know all of that sort of stuff all of those things are, that, that they do actually materially affect our lives so um uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think that cultural effect is very important. I, I think one of them may have been optimism because, uh, you know, I, I get the sense that maybe it was a common thought, a common phrase, maybe something just below the surface of if we could go to the moon, we can do anything. And uh, maybe this, this kind of thought that these challenges that we saw were insurmountable aren't anymore. Yeah, I think so. So one of the things about Bernard Lovell setting up Jodrell Bank was that's what the attitude was during the war. That big infrastructure projects. You could ask for huge amounts of money from the government because they were on a war footing. 
So, mm. you know, if you needed to set up a massive radar dish that's like tons and tons of steel, you just went and asked and said, this is what it is and this is what we need to do. And they'd go and they would rubber stamp it. And then the priorities change and people are kind of less, less bold about it. I think, and you can see that while Kennedy's idea of getting to the moon before the Russians is there, you get people saying yes. And, he, and that idea that every state in the US will contribute something to the mission means everybody's got a bit of a buy-in too. Um, but once you're there, that, that optimism, that idea that we can do anything, well, you've proved you can do anything. You're just not going to, you know, it's just, we're just, we're just going to develop shuttles that go into orbit and keep things much closer. Um, and uh, sorry, it's got really dark here. The, the heavens have opened. Um, I'll just turn a light on. Okay, sounds good. Um, but yeah, I think those those kind of um, yes, there was optimism, but but it can die off very quickly, and that's and that's the issue that that, that kind of yes attitude is uh, is is ephemeral if it's not if it's not you know if you don't build it with roots, I guess is the that's a mixed metaphor, but you know what I mean. Uh, if you don't build it sustainably, maybe it's uh... yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, so my nephew, I, I, uh, he asked me, he said, uh, how could we go to the moon in 1969, but we can't do it today? I've been struggling to find a, a really effective answer. I was wondering what your take might be. Um, I think it comes down to the same thing of what, what, what is the perceived need to go? And, you know, the 60s were very different the, the context of things in the in the fifties and sixties was very different. There was, uh, you know, in the in the most of Europe had uh, suffered bombardment during the Second World War, but the US hadn't, and they knew its effects because they'd seen pictures of it and footage of it, and it's very clear what aerial bombardment did to London and France and wherever else you want to have a look at pictures of bomb cities. And then the USSR has the ability to send missiles at great distances. And mm. suddenly there's a vulnerability there. So, you know, that's why Sputnik was not a, the actual probe of Sputnik is not the most frightening object. You know, it's, it, it's a ball with sticks coming out of it. It doesn't look much. And, it, and what can it do? It bleeps. You know, it's just... But what it represented was the idea that there was something that could be in the air, in the airspace over the US, that they had no stake in or control over or whatever. So tracking technology, technology that could go up and meet it, that meet any of this stuff, that could replicate it, that could do the same, all of that suddenly becomes a, an urgent issue of national security and this stuff. And people are behind it. We, we you know, the US... The, the, you can see interviews with people, vox pops from the time of people going, "Yeah, we've got to, we've got to have this stuff if the Russians have got it, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then Kennedy's speech in the early '60s turns that into a race for the moon, um, a bit of canny politics there of going, "Yeah, we're not up with them in getting into people into space, and we're not up there with, with the stuff they've done, but." I'm going to set a completely different goal and we're going to get there first. And the Russians are like, what? Hang on. That wasn't, is that what this was about? That wasn't the game. You know, it's like very canny bit of, uh, of maneuvering. And that works very well. People get behind it. There's a moment when suddenly with the decade getting on, there's suddenly a sense of this is actually within our grasp. That's a wild idea. That's very exciting. People get behind it. You know, there's, everything from from it's engaging sort of emotively it, it, it appeals to a nationalist or, or patriotic fervor it appeals to you know all of these kind of things people can get on board it but when that goes it's very difficult to get on top of that again and to, to rekindle that enthusiasm and we don't have 
an enemy attempting you know, I mean, it's China and, and, and so on of sending probes to the moon, but not in a way that feels so threatening, that feels so existential in, in what they're doing. Um, there's no sense of without that urgency and stuff, resources get put elsewhere. And the other thing is that, that Kennedy um, basically pitched a 10 year plan you know, we'll get there by the end of the decade, he says in, you know, the beginning of the decade. Um, you, that's a long-term project that, that politics isn't really suited to unless, you, you know, you kind of need something that's going to last beyond an election. Um, and what, what you tend to see is that presidents and prime ministers and whoever else is in government tend to promise what they can deliver by the next election or just after it. So and and Moon Projects is a bit too big for that. So I think I think that's part of the issue. And so what has been prioritised is smaller scale stuff that is deliverable within that shorter time scale. Um, I think the commercial interests in going to the moon and the commercial interests who have got involved in space travel have concentrated minds a bit that governments a are thinking we can spread the costs and the risks with the commercial enterprise. Also that this is a way of getting commercial investment into our countries. Um, because if we support space travel, the, these companies will invest in our industries. Um, and there is a move and, you know, Artemis is happening. And so there is a, a, a move, but it's taken a long time to kind of, make that case really um and you know and, and in the 90s the, the the prospect of space travel you know the movies like armageddon with bruce willis were kind of positing the idea that we needed to get into space to block comets that might destroy us and stuff so you can see that kind of existential argument that's never really um won people over i think um but that's kind of what it needed something to to galvanize because uh, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of investment. Um, so it has to be that, that it's not just there are good reasons for going. It's got to be a really good reason that everybody can get behind. That's that's kind of what you're looking for. And that's what's been missing. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, uh, China has uh, completed their space station. Uh, they have three um, Taikonauts up there uh, right now. Uh, and they've published plans about being on the moon in 2028. Okay. And, you know, people uh, that I've talked to about this, you know, they're like, eh, you've already been there. So what? You know, it's like, if that's what they want to spend their money on, they don't see any, I mean, I, I don't get a general feeling from, you know, a wide section of people that uh, China doing anything in space is really a threat uh, to yeah. the U.S. in the same way that, you know, like Sputnik was. And, and, and you know, in a lot of ways, that is good. That is good that you are not threatened. That is good that there is not a existential threat to, you know, that, that we are facing obliteration, all of that good, good stuff. But it does mean that the idea that you can use it as a, as a justification for the space program, you know, falls away. Um, also, you know, there are, there's permanent bases in Antarctica and different nations have their own spots there and are doing work and research and whatever and they're the legal issues of what jurisdictions and stuff are quite interesting and if you talk to people in the street about why we've got you know why we've got a base in the south pole what are they going to tell you they, they they don't know you know they're kind of like well yeah but if other countries are there then i guess we probably should be and it comes down to that so so it's not as if there isn't a precedent for this um yeah, that's true. Um, okay, uh, just kind of turning our minds to the future. If you were to project out 200 years from now, where do you think we'd be? Uh, like specifically, do you think we have people living in other places besides the earth? Are we still on the earth just making these little kind of, you know, day trips to places? That's, that's difficult because, I mean, obviously I spend an awful lot of my time thinking this stuff through because that's kind of my job is to kind of write stories about this sort of stuff. But 
think about where we were 200 years ago. You know, 200 years ago is before Queen Victoria. Um, it is, they've just, they're just getting to the hang of using steam power to power an engine. They, in trying to work out in the generation that's to come from that, there's a lot of money to be made in working out how to make steam engines more efficient so that you get the most energy, the most movement out of the least input. And from that, from that effort to make steam engines work better, you get the laws of thermodynamics and they work out how heat works and that there's no magic in the world that you can only get out what you put in. You know, stuff doesn't appear from anywhere, from, from nowhere. It's what you put in is what comes out. It's just converted. But also in that process, something is lost. So you always get out less than you put in. You couldn't go to space if you didn't understand that kind of stuff. You couldn't. There's a whole load of mechanical processes and stuff that, that depend on us understanding that. But we didn't know that 200 years ago. Uh, then there's all the stuff with the electronics and electrons and particles and all of that that we found and, and the dynamics of that, which have transformed everything. For example, you and I are having this conversation now, which were in a way that would have been unthinkable 200 years ago. We would have done it by letter if we'd even known each other existed. It would have taken weeks. You know, the, the, the length of conversation we've had now, because I'm wittering on and on, is um, that's like a year of correspondence. That's like a box of letters, you know? So the idea, the, the, the transmission of ideas, the sharing of ideas, the building on ideas, all of that is utterly transformed. So it's very difficult to even think, to even put yourself in the space of what was it like to be alive 200 years ago and, and what was your worldview and, and stuff. Um, and, you know, we can read books from the time and get a sense of it, but, but that your whole context is completely different. And that's what we're facing in 200 times, but with an accelerated, I suspect an accelerated development of ideas and technology and stuff. So I think I would be very surprised if there wasn't presence in space i think there are some existential crises to come that we are already seeing um you know the issues of climate change and and economic issues and the the, the widening disparities between the rich and the poor all of those things are th you know things that are going to cause a lot of trouble in the not too distant future i suspect and do we get past them? Because we might not. Um, d d will our capacity to get into space end up that actually we, we don't have the physical means to do it because we've wrecked civilization as we know it? All of those kind of things. Are, are there enough people who will be able to do it? Are there things, you know, that this was being thought about in the 60s at the same time as there's all this optimism about going to the moon. People like J.G. Ballard are writing books about the end of the space race and, and the ruin of, you know, there's an amazing one, what's it called? One of, they're all called things like the Terminal Beach and the uh, stuff like that. But there's, there's one, I remember the sort of vivid sense of um, people coming out of their homes, I think, or they're standing on the beach to watch the last surviving satellite burn up in the atmosphere. And it's kind mm. of the end of the age and stuff. Um, and I think there's a, I think there's a, the, a bit like that failure of engagement about going to the moon. I think there's a failure of engagement in that it could all just get worse. Um, mm. And we could be on a peak and going over the peak. So, um, yeah, so on my, on my good days, I'm kind of like, yeah, we'll all be in space. We'll all, you know, it'll be like Kim Stanley Robinson had on Mars and we'll all be taking baths together and, in our you know glass tents or whatever it was that he put in his mars trilogy 
Um, and we're going surfing, and uh, there'll be a lot of, is it um, lichens? It's uh, the colonization of Mars is all down to lichen, and they go on picnics and eat lichen. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it'll be like that. Or maybe we'll all be on the ruin of the earth and um, the apes will have taken over and Charles Heston, Charlton Heston will have been right. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of in two, two minds about it because it's such a big... It's such a big distance. The, 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 the potential is so wide, that the, the kind of possibilities are so wide, that it could go any way. Um, and, yeah, depending what mood I'm in, uh, I think we're all doomed, or we're not. Um, and... <laughs> that's, a, that's a difficult place to be. It's like uh, uh, Schroeder's cat, but what the future, <laughs> you know? I'd yeah, open yeah, the box but, yeah. and see what's really in it. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's yeah, it's it's just I don't know. I I think um a few years ago I'd have been much more optimistic, and now I'm kind of like, you know, can we, you know, can you? But human beings can't get their heads around not standing in a doorway and blocking other people's path. You know, you'd think as grown ups, you'd know, don't just stand in a door, don't just stop in the doorway, um, but. That's what people do, and and you know we, we have we have an amazing capacity for for stupidity. So so um, who knows? Who knows? I I hope so. I, I, it'd be quite nice um, to be in space, and that all of those kind of pictures of um, orbiting habitats that NASA put out in the seventies. You know the 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 wheel with the gardens inside it and whatever. I quite fancy that, but um, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, that might be a better way to, you know, you build those near Earth, you move a large number of people there, and then you move the whole thing in mass around the solar system. That might be a far better way to travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm very taken by um, oh, uh, uh, silent running. The, uh, the early 70s sci-fi film where they have a garden in space and it's protected. And I remember that as being, I remember that watching it on telly like one afternoon when I was a kid and being really taken by that idea of gardens in space and they need tending and, you know, the astronaut who's a gardener and stuff. And I watched it again more recently. I went, whoa, this is a pessimistic film about how awful humanity is. Uh, and really in a very... Um, sort of countercultural 60s way of just being very cynical about, you know, the man. Um, and, uh, and I think, yeah, I think that encapsulates it. It's kind of, it's kind of the idea that we, we need to get off the earth as a security thing, because that's how we survive as a, as a species is inspiring, but also, you know, dark. Uh, you know, I think the first people that live on Mars is going to be a really difficult existence. It's going to be challenging. I think uh, technological poverty would be probably the best description of it. And, you know, I don't think anybody would sign up for that willingly. But, you know, as you talk about problems here on Earth, I think one motivation for a mass number of people to go to Mars would be sort of like this decision that the natural problems of Mars, regardless of how overwhelming they might be, might be easier to deal with than the human problems of Earth. And I was wondering what you thought I, about. I think there are parallels, precedents here. Um, the colonization of America is a, you know, there are whole, there's histories of whole communities who went out and died you know, and, and villages and communities that just disappeared and stuff. Um, is it uh, Roanoke, I think it's called, um, uh, uh, and stuff like that, where you kind of go, yeah, but people didn't stop going. They didn't stop, I mean, and, and then all of the, let alone all the legacies of, of the, the different, um, the different kind of experiences of, depending who you were and where you came from and the differences, you know, if you were enslaved or, or, 
whatever the, the vast numbers of people who who died in what we will refer to as the or what is generally referred to as the settlement of an, in America, let alone that there were already people there, uh, and so on. So so that kind of difficult, awful history, and 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 um, I think people, you know, I think if you, I was saying that you can't really understand what um, people's lives were like 200 years ago. You know, for all you can read Jane Austen or, or the diaries of Benjamin, or, or, you know, the writings of Benjamin Franklin, you don't really get that sense of what it was like with no police, no aspirin, no medical care, you know, the, the, the potential hazard that you could just die that day from, you know, because there were so many hazards of one sort or another around, um, that life was tough and for most people quite short. Um, incidents of infant mortality, incidents of uh, maternal mortality, all of those kind of things that, that people just live with every day as a reality that we just can't get our heads around. Um, and I think, but I, but I think that what that, what that means is that actually there is a kind of history of us going out to new territory. And that's in a lot of cases, that, I think that's what, what I noticed when I was doing my article about coverage of the moon landings, the, you know, everything from, um, Walter Cronkite reporting on the moon landings to the language used in Star Trek and whatever talks about pioneering and they don't mean pioneering as we've developed a new technology they mean pioneering like we're on a we're in covered covered wagons setting out west that's that's the you know Star Trek was wagon train in space you know that's 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 a very conscious thing and and that kind of cultural inheritance i guess is the is the idea um whereas in in the uk and stuff that's not quite the cultural thing that, that was being put forward it was much more the idea of exploration and discovery in the kind of way that captain scott had gone to his death in the south pole that's 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 more the kind of um way it was framed i guess um so and as you say there are people who want to go to space there are people who volunteer for it i've, I've spoken to so uh, there's a tv show here the sort of astronomy show the sky at night which has been running for you know 60 odd years one of the presenters on that you know she's got a um family kids all of that kind of stuff um and yet she's quite open if there was a one-way trip to mars she would take it and and I, I thought, you know, there are people who, who do it. And, and so I think it will happen. It's just, as I say, whether it's, whether it's lasting and how many people go and what kind of, um, what kind of hierarchies, what kind of structures are involved in people going? Um, is it only, you know, the, the thing about the commercialization of space is it means it's become a thing for the extremely wealthy, the billionaires, the the billionaires and their guests is what space travel has is you know venturing into. Does that mean that permanent settlements on the moon will all be casinos and fancy hotels for the super wealthy, and us hoi polloi will be burning up on Earth and whatever you know that, those kind of things are. are I find, um, yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff that troubles my the inside of my head, and I turn into stories. I, I like to take that two hundred year question and turn it around on you. Uh, so let's imagine you're living two hundred years in the future, yeah. And for whatever reason, you're thinking back to the twenty twenties. What would you remember? That's interesting. That is interesting. So. Um, I think I think climate is going to be our response to climate. And this is a real and pressing 
issue and how we're dealing with it or not dealing with it is um, an issue. I think technology is changing our sense of ourselves and our relationships and my children's interactions on phones and tablets and stuff and, and dealing with their friends is very different from the way I do it that 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 you know that that the the kind of ways they interact and, and deal with each other and I think that will have an impact on identity um and and kind of the idea of the erosion of the of certain boundaries about privacy and, and things like that so I think we're on the cusp of various cultural changes which we, because we're right in the middle of it we can't really um we can't really judge where that is um and I think I also think there is a a generation born in the shadow of the Second World War who are dying off now, who in the West have had a rather easy ride and they've been relatively wealthy, they've been well fed, they've been well educated, they've been well looked after by social systems and they have protected themselves very well as well. Um, and I think that kind of dominant culture is under is changing you know the demographics of of the us and the demographics of of, of uh the uk are changing and that older generation who've kind of dictated the kind of cultural norms is um i, th I think things like uh what's the word um There, there was a kind of there was a kind of thing about um when people went to the moon that what what they saw that representing was kind of monolithic and i'm not sure we have that now i'm not sure um i don't know i don't it, it's, it's such a big question that i don't want to i don't want uh, I do think there's a generational shift in because technology and the way we relate to each other has changed things a lot. And I can see that the way my children interact with the world and think about the way they interact with the world and their friends and their social relationships and where they get information from and what they trust and what they don't trust and all of those kind of things is very profoundly different from me and almost unintelligible to my parents generation and that and the effects of that I, I i think we're just beginning to get our heads around um and i think that will be in 200 years time we'll look back and kind of go there was a a watershed moment there was a there was a there was a before and an after and we're kind of in that space there and a lot of the things that in the in the west we've taken for granted i think we'll look back on and kind of go yeah this is where things changed i think uh, you know it's 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 kind of interesting i mean as you were, were talking um it made me think that one of the things we've seen over the past 100 200 years has been more of a dis disintegration of the generation like, um, because technology has changed so much over the course of people's lives um, and its effect has been so profound that the different generations are more alien to each other. I think, so H.G. Wells wrote a um, sci-fi movie in the 30s called uh, The Shape of Things to Come or Things to Come and it begins with a so it starts in 1936 and it then you know follows 
events through a century or so. And it begins with a Christmas, um, family Christmas in 1936, where the grandpa, who's clearly a, Victor, you know, an elderly Victorian gent, not long for the world, whatever, is tutting about the toys that the young children have got, because the, you know, he never had toys like this, and they don't know how lucky they are, and it's not really what Christmas is about, and so on and so on. And it's kind of like a thing that has been said by every generation, you know, it's, it's a whatever. And it works really well for that film because of what it's about to do. But, you know, that's a film that my grandfather saw in the cinema as a young man. And then as an old man, I can remember him saying things like that to me. And I'm now an old man and I'm saying the same type, kind of thing to my children as they pester me about Christmas lists. Um, so I think there's a there's a sense that it was always like this, that there was always a generational shift and, and stuff. I think um, but I th I think the it's it's not about it's not about stuff that people have got, but it's about the interactions of how you you know how you get things and how you deal with stuff and 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 it, it shapes your it shapes your perspective of of what's going on and who you are and the idea that you have your physical self but you also have a digital version of yourself that's out there that's not that doesn't look like you that doesn't necessarily have your name but that people know and can be friendly with and have relationships with and whatever and that you can dump that digital persona but also that you can have but no, that nothing is forgotten because it all survives on the somewhere that people can search it so a thing you said as an eight-year-old can come back to bite you when you're <clears throat> 30 or 40 all of that kind of stuff that is not that is not the same as the perennial conversations we've had between the generations. That's that's a that affects how we conduct ourselves, how we exist, how we interact. And I think those are the kinds of things that are different. Um, and they and and we talk to people from outside our community, you know, our physical communities. I'm talking to you now very easily. I have a number of people I talk to in the States fairly regularly. Um, whereas I don't talk to my neighbours, you know, my mm. physical, or I do, I do right. talk to some of my neighbours, but do you know what I mean? I, 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 I've got closer relationships with people who live on the other side of the world than I have with people who live in my immediate vicinity. And so all of that kind of stuff is, is, and that changes the experience that we're getting in and, 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 and the, information we receive and and stuff so all of those things i think are quite um are quite profound but i don't really know what the result of that will be but that i but i think those things, sorts of things will affect um our ability to go into space in the future and our ability to settle anywhere and that kind of stuff yeah those are those are definitely some interesting effects but uh it's so true you know um it, it might be why it's so hard to uh, fix problems in the community is because everybody's sort of not really living in their physical space. They're living in their, their virtual space. I, but I also find it amazing how much you can fix because the information is there. Mm. You know, a bulb goes in your house or the plug doesn't work or there's a leaky roof. And you can look up what you need to do and get that information within minutes. Um, and that idea that, that you can just grab the solution and you can just go out and get it. And it gives you, and, and that's not just about, you know, DIY, but it's about cooking stuff. It's about finding things out. It's about whatever, um, whatever, you know, you want to know the lyrics to a song, which is what my six-year-old is always after about, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. You can just get that information. So that that agency 
of being able to get it, but also the way that you can inform yourself is, is revolutionary, but comes with all the caveats about where is this information coming from? Is it trusted information? All of those kind of things. Um, but again, that, that completely changes how you engage with the world around you, I think. I think, and, and that's a, that's a um, what's the word? Uh, uh, and I think, I think things like the engagement with going into space are helped by it. Um, by, are helped by the idea that you can, you can, you know, that what, what do they put up on social media that gets people excited? They put up the launch and they put up pictures of the earth from space and here's what the artemis project has taken pictures of today and whatever and those get spread and shared and stuff because it excites people and whatever and there is something weird about the idea and quite fun i think about the idea that what has galvanized this new generation of interest in space is that you can share pictures of it on social media and it's a big social media draw. Um, I think, I, you know, that, that that because that's about, that's about we can go to the moon because it gives us something to engage with between ourselves socially here. Um, I think, I, you know, that, that kind of appeals to me a bit. That, that is uh, neat. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, you know, being able to have the answers so readily available though does it make it does it mean that our ability to generate and explore answers ourselves um kind of and you know uh do we do we lose that ability like uh, you know the, the fact that we can just put in any question to a tool and get an answer back does it keep us from being able to develop the skills we need to be able to probe uh, those, those questions? Um, that's a good question. I think, well, when I was at school, the, the issue was whether we should be allowed to use calculators, whether that helped us with maths or made us worse at maths. Um, and I remember that being a big topic. And the idea was that the calculator allowed you to do more complicated things once you'd grasped the basics. That, that seemed to be the, the idea. And the thing about being online is you're not a passive, you don't just soak it up. You, in, you are part of it. And a lot of information that appears online, but all information that, put, that appears online has been put up by somebody, but also a lot of it has been reworked as a result of interaction. So Wikipedia, for example, has a lot of contributors and a lot of editors, and they are continually honing that information that is there. Now there are, you know, there are all the usual caveats about how fact checking is done and biases and whatever and what level it should be written at. But there's a constant engagement to make that information more useful and better fit for purpose and to keep it accurate in a way that you just can't do with books and journals and stuff. Um, and I think there is quite an attitude of, if you see something wrong, you try and correct it or try and, you know, that's, there's a lot of spats and arguments online because of this. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the trouble is that you you can very easily I mean, this is really a, a, a conversation from another time, but the, but all the things about confirmation bias and, and kind of losing yourself in a in a um, in a bubble that only tells you what you want to hear uh, is one thing. But also, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of um, fact checking that goes on online. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who spend their time 
checking the veracity of statements or, or um, looking. So, you know, I posted a photograph only the other day, uh, yesterday, in fact, and within minutes, um, somebody had replied with the date that photo was taken and who was in it. Um, wow. And, and, you know, that those kind of things are... are we take those kind of things for granted that you can put, you can put something up and go, look, I've got a, I've, you know, does anyone know what town this is? Or can ever, can anyone remember what that movie is where this happens? And so those kind of things are, are where people engage and, and get you to the answer. And then because of that, you can kind of build on top of it. So I don't know. I, I think I de it, there's definitely a positive side to it. And, and just the fact that my children just expect to be able to find things. You know, I remember my daughter te telling me she wanted to watch a movie and she told me what happened in it. And so I was searching for what that what that movie could possibly be. And it's like, you know, it was a cartoon and it had unicorns and it had this and it had that. And, blah, blah. and after about an hour of fruitless searching and asking around and stuff, I had to ask my daughter whether it was something that actually existed. <laughs> And it didn't, but she just assumed that you said what you wanted and that could, that would be there. And that would be amazing. You know, you would like uh, interview a, a set of moviegoers and uh, the movie doesn't exist. And based upon what they say, it generates the movie. Well, you know, that's, that's, to be honest, that's how the first Hammer Frankenstein film was done. Um, mm. Because they couldn't, um, they were, so Frankenstein, the novel was out of copyright, but the Universal Boris Karloff movie was still in copyright and Universal were quite litigious. So the team at Hammer basically said, we want to do a Frankenstein film, but it can't be anything like the Universal film. And one of their, I think he was one of their editors. He wasn't even a writer, had never seen the Universal film and had never read the book, but had a vague idea about what, Frankenstein was about so he wrote a screenplay which is what he thought Frankenstein was and that's what they made with Peter Cushing in it and and you just that's an amazing amazing thing to do um and it's a huge hit because everybody felt they knew it as well so um and uh, and now you know if you've seen that and then you read the book you go oh this is, wasn't, wasn't ex what I was expecting at all um and that kind of mythological uh, uh version I think is is quite interesting but um yeah, but but I think that my my point is that my daughter has this idea that information is out there for the taking and should be accessible and you should just be able to grab it and take it and make it your own and whatever. And I find that you know for all the for all the bad sides of on online experience and stuff, I find that really really quite exciting. Um, it is. Well, Simon, I really appreciate your generosity of your time and talking to me today. I know we covered a whole wide range of uh, subjects, but before we kind of close up, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on? Um, I, I find it quite interesting that you're talking about the moon and the, the, um, the, the more profound thing, I think, than the moon is how far can we get? into space so you know voyager one and voyager two uh way out uh in the darkness but still have a long long way to go before they get out of the solar system per se um and you know we're talking eighty thousand years i think it is before they get to another star um and i think i think the kind of limit is, the, the, the issue is what is our limit where, where do we where does humanity get to how far do we get? Do we get, you know, do we set up a colony on Pluto? Do we set up a colony on the rocks and stuff? Are we, are we going to have mining stations out there? What, where, where, I mean, I, I don't know. I find, I find it fascinating. Where, where do you think we will get to? I personally think this generation will be multi-planetary. Next generation will be multi-cellular. So that's wow. uh, my, my thought. But, um, you know, the, the thing is, technology is so unpredictable. You know, I mean, it, we only were able to have recorded sound in the late 1800s. Uh, and now, you know, we have recorded sound, video, telecommunications, everything. I mean, we went for 
thousands and thousands of years without this technology that's all around us. And we had like this explosion of technology and we keep thinking that it's going to progress forward, but um, are the kind of um, the things that generate that technology still alive in a well today to cause it to continue going forward or have that, has that diminished and atrophied and you know, it's going to be um, essentially we'll have technology that we'll depend on, but don't understand and it falls apart and society, you know, really decays, uh, you know, it's really difficult to, I mean, what happens when Google goes away, you know, like uh, you had this, you had this one guy that understood how to keep it up, you know, and he's not doing that anymore and it's not up, but nobody knows how to look up the answer. And, and you know, I mean, like what, it's hard to imagine, right? But, but all this technology requires uh, maintenance and is the cost of the maintenance so high that we don't have enough uh, leftover for innovation or motivation for innovation? Uh, or can we not even pay that bill? And then, um, you know, kind of like the technology starts to decay and we're in a worse shape. Uh, so I don't know, it's, it's, it'd be really interesting uh, to see how it all plays out. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've yeah, I've I've, I've kind of watching with what's been happening with Twitter over the last few weeks, and just kind of going, are we all going to have to move and start again with relationships and whatever, or you know maybe not bother and go off and do something more useful? Um, I don't know. I, I, yes, it feels like we're on the cusp of something, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Like cusp ledge edge you know yeah, yeah, abyss, yeah. <laughs> something like that yeah. yeah 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 but then you know i wonder if 200 years ago when uh you had for the first steam engines people were like we're on a precipice it's we're gonna go we're gonna be moving at 12 miles an hour and no human being can su can support that we're all gonna be uh <laughs> it's the end of the world well i'll be pancakes yeah <laughs> unable to breathe <laughs> well uh, simon thank you so much i hope you have a good rest of your day and it's been thank such you. a joy to get to talk to you you've, you've made me think which is why i've kind of stuttered and uh, uh paused and things because uh, actually a lot of that is uh is is big heavy stuff so thank you very much i feel like i've worked out for the day <laughs> awesome okay well take care bye-bye nice speaking to you bye. Nice speaking to you too.